Welcome to the Garage Strength Podcast. But before we begin, if you didn't know, we have a podcast channel on YouTube, the Garage Strength Podcast, where we dive deep into multiple different topics, really nitty gritty topics around sports performance, uh, strength and conditioning, general fitness, and sometimes cartoons and music. Uh, we also have channel streams over on Spotify, uh, the Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. And please give us those five stars. It can help us tremendously. And this show is also sponsored by Peak Strength. Peak Strength is our own personally designed strength and conditioning app where you can head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store, and you can download Peak Strength for seven free days of training. And during those seven free days, you can cancel at any given time. But the worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna get five free workouts specific to your needs, specific to your sport, specific to your peak date. Because remember, freaks, at some point, you have to begin your journey to attain peak strength. And I am here with my three-time, I guess, is it three times? It's three times. Three-time co-author, world champion of the year. <laughs> I'm just combining all these things. Earl Kunkel. Earl, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Are you excited to be on the the, the this live forum? So we're, I, I didn't realize that we were going to be live on the GS channel. On the, the big... The big boy. Yeah. And and in my head, it was like, oh, we're going to go live on the Garage Strength podcast channel. And then yeah. like three minutes before we came in here, we were like talking about it. And Jason, the director, producer, was like, no, dude, we're going to be live on Garage Strength. I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> you have to read your text messages a little with uh, better comprehension skills. <laughs> I thought he was very clear. This is what we were doing. Well, I, I think it's like read it with better comprehension and also pay attention when I'm reading it. Yeah, I think I think the problem is, is that I feel You're too used to audible. You needed someone to read it out loud to you. <laughs> <laughs> also, Jason is so good at just telling me what I need to do at all moments of the day and and just pacifying me is that part of his like job description personal assistant yeah we should have put that in there jason as like your five star review that was like the little <laughs> bonus dane's dane's personal assistant uh, that tells him that texts him every morning dane i'm ready to film can you stop talking to trevor and come downstairs <laughs> <laughs> so what are we talking about here hamstrings oh, talking about ooh. hamstrings today are you um, jealous that my hamstrings are longer and stronger than yours, as displayed by my 31-inch vertical today, even without a not warm -up, really at the age of 39 and balding? I hurt myself yesterday running hill sprints again. <laughs> oh my gosh, on your hamstring, opposite um, adductor. Ooh. So I did it on the left leg. I do it on before I even take the first step. Essentially, I plant to go. Yeah. And like, if my foot sort of like ducks out a little bit, my ad doctor takes over yeah and it just will go like and i like stop because i know if i keep going it's gonna go it sounds like you you struggle with specific co-contractions in that joint. maybe i don't know maybe I your glutes your, your glutes and your hamstrings aren't firing together maybe i have to do a better job warming up at almost 40 years of age well, instead that, of yeah. just being like oh, i'm gonna go run hill spritz yeah. with my kid that's very fair <laughs> that's absolutely accurate the day after i did legs too like, yeah let's see what happens I just wanted to share, since you jumped so high, I just ran uphill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my vertical is pretty good. I, I, if I you would have to, told me 37, I would have believed you. I, I wanted to point this out uh, before we go further into the hamstrings, is that Noah was watching me do the vertical jump, and he's like, dude, you're doing like a kettlebell swing hinge into a vertical. Your counter movement is not an actual like squat at all. So I had jumped like 28 or 29, I did, and I did like two where I – dropped a little bit more with my knee with more knee flexion yeah and that's when i i hit 31 uh but what were you testing on was it like one of the mats the jump, where you mat, jump up? yeah jump mat so it's that one's really tough to it's hard to cheat as long as you don't bring your feet up can you bring your knees up and cheat it you can but it's like you're a tool if you do that you should have did that just to see the difference <laughs> yeah and and use like a different video yeah a b tested or yeah. something like that um so hamstrings, not only to make you faster, but keep away from injury. So you can be fast and jump 31 inches like you. Correct. Or be old and get hurt like me. Correct. See? Both of those. Look how we set that up. There we go. Man, that's some improv there. <laughs> um, let's talk about the imagine part, right? So 
Stepping into the gym, Dane. Yep. And today is the day you're going to hammer your hamstrings. You clean. You single leg squat. And now it's time for accessory work. Now, you've done RDLs with a snatch grip before and a clean grip. You've done single leg RDLs, chaos RDLs, and other variations of RDLs. Every RDL known to me. Yeah. Man. You worked the reverse hyper until your lower back was bulletproof. You hammered the glute ham developer and even rocked out with some isometric movements and razor curls. You love doing hamstring curls on a machine to get that classic bodybuilder pump, but you want a challenge and you want impenetrable hamstrings. Ooh. I know. You like that word? Yeah. That was a $10 word. Yeah, I like that. Two master's degrees from <laughs> Patriot League school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You have your mind set on doing Nordic curls now. I have two degrees. Do you? <laughs> I have Celsius and Fahrenheit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll go back. You'll go back to the imagining here. That was part of my imagining. Yeah, you did well, Dane. I'm, pr <laughs> I'm proud of you. So today's the day you're doing Nordic curls for accessories. Right. All okay. those other things. Maybe the razor curls, and depending on how difficult you make them or don't make them, I would say almost any athlete walking into the gym can do a variation of. The Nordic curl you can't fake in any way. Or can you? No, I, I mean, well, you you could a little bit if you have more hip flexion. But then it, you're just doing like a razor curl yeah, essentially, right? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. And the only time I think that you'll see the cheating would be that it would – pay off is when you come all the way back to that starting position where you're in like a 90 degree on the knee flexion and then a 90 degree on the hip flexion mm -hmm. you will get like a large so what i've seen with the emg studies is like there'll be a large amount of action through the hamstrings at that point but it's not necessarily going to lead to the amount of strength gain that you see um, doing a traditional Nordic without having, you know, you want to keep hip extension as much as possible while you're flexing your knee. So would like the hip when you're like sort of, you look more like a Z yeah. than an L. Yep. will still develop the strength in your hamstrings. Just yeah. won't develop it to the degree. Right. Am I hearing that it's okay to like bend when you're learning the movement until you develop sort of the requisite strength to do the L. Yeah. So, so this is something I think that's important because I, I actually saw like a recent influencer talking about like, Oh, you should never be doing a Nordic, you know, with that, with that hip flexion. And it's, first of all, let's, I have video of Nick Singleton doing Nordics pretty regularly with a little bit of hip flexion. Like it's going to happen no matter what. And this is one of the fastest football players on the planet. Like, He's extraordinarily fast. So I think it's okay to do this. Uh, and, and I think it just needs to be clear that we need to, in the realm of fitness or strength and conditioning, sports performance, not talk so much in absolutes. But with this specific discussion, when you're, when you're learning a Nordic, first of all, I think it's important that if we're looking at a progression, if you can hold a position through the eccentric portion of the lift – you're still going to get stronger and you're still going to be able to make progress. And then as you get better and better and better, you know, the first part of the concentric might have that hip flexion. And then as you get stronger, maybe the hip flexion happens a little bit later. And then as you get really, really strong and you're proficient at that exact movement, the Nordic curl, then you can maintain hip extension, the entire lift. So it's like, it's all part of a progression and it and it comes down to you know you could elevate the bench a little bit or to make it a little bit easier and shorten the range of motion you could you could do that for a couple sets and then you could do you know hip flexion in like a cheat nordic curl but it's all going to lead to some form of adaptation that's going to strengthen your hamstrings all right so with that idea of strengthening the hamstrings mm -hmm. and i mentioned a bunch of different exercises you pointed out all the different types of rdls you could do and let's not say one specific exercise but more like general and all-encompassing here's an umbrella it's raining out type of thing we want to stay dry why is it so important that we build hamstring strength i think one it's 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 extremely important for knee stability uh so like joint co-contractions around the knee okay and and co-contracting your hamstrings and your quad together when you're when you're running or cutting and you you have to plant and turn, you know, a, a specific direction if your hamstrings are strong enough and they can co-contract with your quads, it, it creates that silenced 
position so that you can get out of that cut faster for agility. Uh, I think also if you look at hip extension, um, you know, at the if you're doing a vertical jump, actually, a lot of your hamstrings will be involved with that vertical jump. And then a lot of injuries. So there was a recent study that we've talked about on a couple different live streams and, and even on a couple different specific videos where we talked about the biceps femoris is the main um, the main hamstring muscle that gets injured the most. It's so, like it's like 73 percent of the time. So if I'm listening, if I'm there and I like put my hand on the back of my hamstring, where am I touching to get my bicep femoris? Like the to meat, like, the meat of it. So like, where it's like thick. So yeah. like, and it would be like biceps femoris, semi tendinosis, semi membranosis would be the smaller part. But it's the semi tendinosis and the bicep femoris are really what get injured the most, and they're really the strongest hamstring muscles. Like the three out of the, they're the two strongest out of those three, and going so those two basically build up the meat of your hamstrings and they really are responsible for you know knee flexion hip extension uh co-contractions in the knee i believe even to a point you could argue co-contractions in your hip um and, and those muscles play such a major role in in speed and force production because they're so fast twitch um that if you strengthen them and you train them really well, they're going to get really explosive. And, 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 and from a research perspective, we've even seen, um, not the research that I've done, but that I've read, is that the stronger your semitendinosis is relative to your biceps femoris, the less likely you will be of injuring your biceps femoris. So you want to strength train using a Nordic because it really triggers uh, high action from the semitendinosis, which in turn, you know, brings that strength disparity a little bit closer. That that strength, um, I guess you would call it a deficit or something like that. Yeah, it, it like catches it up. It it's catches like, that up, and then that prevents that hamstring injury that you could be having. And that's actually you could almost say it like anchors it. Yeah, and you don't want as heavy as an anchor, like yeah. weighing you down, if you will. You, I was even thinking for you, that actually might be what you're injuring is, is, a, is the biceps femoris because your semitendinosis is not sh that strong. Yeah. That's what happens and, when you're weak like me. <laughs> Get called smalls for years. And then it just, it just yeah. leads to your hamstring strength. I got to get become, stronger hamstrings. They become small. Well, that's what happens when I don't ha do Nordic curls. like On a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's like, it's it's an interesting thing. It's funny because we filmed this morning. We filmed um, the one full body workout, and we had I don't know if you remember the in the script the the dumbbell floor bench with sliding yes. leg curls. And so what was crazy is I was doing that, and later today, like after we filmed, you know, I was doing floor bench. And I did five reps, and I did the slow. We were using like hundred twenty pound dumbbells just I, to like. I just use eighties because I. It's hard to get them unless I have a spotter. It's hard to get yeah. them on my quads. But holding that hip. That's because you have small quads. <laughs> They're too big. They don't fit. Yeah, that's, that might be, it might be accurate, actually. But holding that hip extension, you're using your glutes and your hammies, and then you're doing that slow extension of the knee and then knee flexion. And what was crazy is that later on you start to feel that. And to me, that's part of a progression that could lead to you know, hamstring training on the Nordics. And I think that you you start to realize when you're doing a movement like that, how much, like even when you're bench pressing on a normal bench press, I've gotten hamstring cramps yes. benching, you know, because you're squeezing so much to develop that hip extension, which then can be transferred into force into your shoulders. And so that's like, that's stuff that a lot of people don't think about when they're actually training their hamstrings is, and it and it's going to be similar to every sport as well when you're in those mechanical positions. Now you were hinting at sort of loading up to like if we say the Nordic curl is like a creme de la creme, yeah, hamstring movement, and it's a hard movement to do. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about sort of like top threes, and we can start at one of two ways. I'll let you make this decision. We start at the top three where you basically are dealing with your elite athletes okay. who you can just throw an exercise at them they do it. and they have the capability and it's not necessarily like the first time they can do it, but like they will get there. They'll get it, it done. It will happen. 
Or would you rather start with like start with the progression lower? All right, so let's start with a novice athlete. Yeah. Either first person, first time in the gym type of thing, or it's a young kid, and a, we'll just say average young kid, not someone who's like, oh wow, they have all these capabilities. Just who knows how or why? Mm-hmm. Um, what are the three hamstring exercises you're like giving them from an accessory standpoint? Right, straight accessory. The first yeah. thing, dude. My favorite thing to do, and and people disagree with this stuff but i would take our mobility band and i'd have them stand on the handles and wrap that around their neck and the reason doing this i'd have it around their neck and then i'd make them do a good morning so they would hip hinge the biggest problem so if we had a kid who is 11 or 12 years old the the hardest thing for them to learn is how to arch their back and how to arch their back and recruit their hamstrings at the same time while they have knee flexion. So the, the cue would be, I want you to hold knee flexion. I want you to put your butt back, maybe touch a wall uh, with your butt and then come back up. And the band sets that tension so they immediately arch because it's like a tactile cue. Um, yeah, they, even with the wall back there, yeah, it's yeah, tactile. They, they can feel it. So it's like, okay, now they're doing they're doing a banded good morning with very low load and they start to feel their hamstrings work accordingly. Remember, a lot of these kids, when they first start training, they don't know how to coordinate yet. They just, they don't have the experience. There's, Especially if they're a larger kid, yeah, too. Like, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you have young kids. Yeah. I have young kids. My favorite thing to notice is how the smaller kids just look more athletic yeah. than the taller, bigger kids. Because they're figuring out their body. Yeah. It's, yeah. So that's absolutely 100% accurate. So that would be uh, Bandit Good Morning, I would say probably my favorite way and that's my favorite way to teach somebody how to even hold that that arched back right so they they can learn how to do a clean or a snatch something like that um the next thing i would want to do would be if they can do that with uh with a banded good morning i'd have them like hold a plate or hold really really light dumbbells and do like a stiff-legged deadlift where they have like almost knee extension but just slight knee flexion still and i'd have them come forward a little bit more so the butt wouldn't hinge as much and they would just come forward so now they're sort of changing the the point of where the lever arm would be and they're coming forward more and that's going to really lengthen the heck out of their hamstrings while they still have the band on so it's like a change in the lever arm and a change a little bit with how how they're the tactile feeling because now they have a load in their hands um, and then the third one, honestly, dude, the, the third one would probably be just a simple leg curl, like get them just get over the fact that the leg curl, like people will cry about it. But if, if, if you get a kid on there, who's 12 years old and you tell him to come up and squeeze his heels to his butt and he's got to hold it for three seconds and then go down through a slow eccentric dude, they're going to light up their hamstrings. And even if they don't feel it on that day, after a couple of days or a couple of sequences yeah. through this, they'll feel it and they'll figure it out and they'll start to be more aware. And that's where like the mind muscle actions the mind muscle connections come into play. Like a lot of people say, Oh, my muscle connection is not real. It's, it's not real when you're dealing with, well, one, I would argue it is real, but sometimes in research, you'll see it's not real. If somebody is a little bit more advanced, uh, ironically, but in this case, it's like, no, my muscle connection works with younger kids because they start to feel the fatigue. They start to feel it localized and then they can control it a little bit more. Yeah. Well, wouldn't they technically like there'd be more noise? Yeah. So the like intention would help with like the afferent and efferent signals. Am I yes, getting I, that yes, right? Yeah. Where a more advanced athlete like it's already they're, been automated yeah and they're globally w- operating yeah. at higher speed so it doesn't need to travel yes. here to there like from brain to yeah they're just doing it's it. it's already developed yeah. so from maybe that information where you're saying like the advance actually is more reason to support it for if, younger kids for younger kids yeah around like the narrative with it um yeah. all right so that's three there yep um i do want to say machines are phenomenal for like single joint stuff yep multi-joint like compound movements are phenomenal too yeah um but like any good cook you don't throw out ingredients if you right, will like right. you, you got you make with but what, what you, if you're you a bad do. cook girl well i don't know go play poker or something <laughs> <laughs> or start baking like <laughs> yeah. find your calling or whatever yeah, yeah that's but, that's good so did you want me to lay out? No. Well, we got the three for the beginner. We we still got to go into intermediate athletes. Oh, now. intermediate. So now, like, okay. how do you like? All right, they're doing this. You see this? 
they know how to train. They okay, know how, so, yeah. But they maybe don't have the requisite strength yet. Right. What are you doing now to progress them? Okay, so this this would be I would try to get you know I'll I'll use the example of so I use leg curls right and that's a a single joint movement so for this this intermediate person let's say that the intermediate individual um, they can they can execute they can execute the hip hinge and they can do that well so what I would do then is say okay intermediate single joint I want to do like a furniture slider. Uh, with hip extension so they're going to be doing like a glute bridge but only doing knee flexion knee extension knee flexion knee extension a lot of intermediate kids so this would be like seventh eighth ninth grade they'll get hamstring cramps like immediately when they do it Um, so that would be the single joint Um, the the multi-joint movement here that could be a little bit another machine base would be like let's do a glute ham full term so you go all the way down and you try and come up here and if they can come all the way back up almost like the nordic part of on it. the glute ham yeah if they're strong enough if they're good athletes i just want to say one that time could be advanced you but. program that holding a dumbbell for me yeah and i started i was like oh a dumbbell i grabbed a 15 and i was like you're an it after i tried to do like a rep i was like oh my god why was that so hard and yeah. i immediately was like i think i'm going to use a 10 pound dumbbell well and something that you could do is go like a 10 second eccentric the whole way through drop the dumbbell and then come back yeah up. So i was you, able to do it but it, it i was, was not prepared for when it kicked in yeah during like the nordic part and that's where i think it's being aware of that could be an intermediate to advanced. That would be later on with a kid when he's probably in like eighth or ninth grade and he's starting, he's been training, she's been training for a while and they're, they're getting pretty strong. Then I would put in like a dumbbell RDL or a dumbbell stiff legged where we start to load it up a little bit more and they're doing like four sets of nine. Are you like doing 50s. the single leg yet? At the Not yet. I would, I would start to put that in a little bit later. Okay. I mean, you could, you could do like a single leg RDL with their back leg supported. You could do, Single, would you, would you do the chaos one? Not yet. Okay. Not till the advanced. I think the chaos. So getting into the advanced, the chaos single leg RDL to me is like the pistol squat of hamstrings. Like you have no feeling on that back leg because of the chaos position, and you've got to really hammer that front hammy, and, and and you've got to hammer through you know through hip extension as well. And I think that that's where. I love the single leg and, and single leg RDLs, you know, like we mentioned earlier, we've got 30 of them. They're all great. And I think that looking at a single leg RDL is going to be more advanced. It's also going to be more advanced if they're doing it with a chaos position. And it's also going to be more advanced, especially if you start to do it with more. Load. Should we explain what the chaos position is? Probably. Yeah. All right. So I'm thinking of it and you can correct yeah, yeah. me if I'm wrong. Your back leg is on a band, yep. something very unstable and it's up. Where, like when you would go, you'd be like looking like a T yeah. where it's at level Yeah, wise. and that's where you put your foot. And then it's just you balance on the, the one leg. Yeah, you and, balance on that front leg, and then that's how you do the RDL. Yeah. I you know no going into the more advanced stuff too is even okay you got Nordics you got razor curls we would hammer them but I would also add in a snatch grip RDL or a snatch grip stiff legged deadlift stiff legged deadlifts lengthen the heck out of your hamstrings and then I know I was only supposed do you to do, do three. Them? Um, from a deficit ever. Like yeah, you, you could stand do it on a bench or something. You could do it deficit. You could do it with your toes elevated. And I know I'm only supposed to give you three of these, but that's where the RDLs, the snatch grip, uh, stiff legged deads, the chaos, the Nordics, the razors, the glute hand with a bar on your back, even with a bent knee. Now you're starting to see like, this is where you've got to really make sure that if your athletes are getting stronger, they're getting more explosive, they're doing all the impulse work, they're doing all the athlete day training, you've got to make sure you're stimulating that adaptation from the hamstrings on multiple different facets so that their hamstrings and their knees and their hips are healthy and they can perform at top speed. One thing I love about all these exercises you've been given, you hardly touch on the glute ham developer. Oh, like just hammering like the reverse hyper? Or? Yeah, well, just like the GHD oh, machine. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I know how many creative ways you use it. Like, yeah. you didn't even talk about, like, any of the isometric stuff you yep. do with hamstrings. Yeah. You, uh, how you'll tie it in with upper body movements. Yep. You didn't talk sprinter. Sprinter glute ham. Yeah, like. Or even, like, uh, what, what one thing we did with Jan. Sprinter glute ham is phenomenal, but even with You want to tell everyone what it is exactly, too, with, like. With, the, like. 
Because well, sprinter glute ham would be you have a single leg planted yeah. in the glute in the GHD, and you go down and come back up, go down and come back up, and then you. So it's a legs. unilateral exercise yeah, for your hamstring and lower back a little bit. Now another one is if we're looking at hamstrings, they respond well to perturbations. Your back responds really well to isometrics. So one thing that we'll do is we'll take like a we call it a shit show. Uh, we'll take the shit show and we'll put on a bamboo bar and then we'll attach banded dumbbells or kettlebells. And then let's say we're on a glute ham and you just go up to here at 180. So you go boom as fast as you can. So that's all hamstring action working the hip extension. Then you go hold it and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You hold it for like seven seconds. But the slow seven or quick seven. If I'm doing it, if I'm counting for the athlete, very slow. <laughs> if I'm doing it very fast, but the perturbation comes in hip extension, the perturbations come in from the dumbbells shaking. Yeah. The isometric comes in from holding that, that position. And then you go back down controlled, boom, up as fast as you can. And maybe you do three to five reps, but that's something that then that transfers even to a vertical jump. Yeah. So it's like, and then that transfers to holding better positions in other exercises that lead to uh, that lead to hamstring development. Yeah, you know, we have even talked about the single leg squat, which is probably yeah. the best multi joint. Um, I think I have it in here at some point. And it, and it just <laughs> it's like I think for us it comes down to knowing where the athlete's weak, knowing where they're strong, knowing how well they achieve hip flexion versus hip extension, knowing you know do they have any past injuries. Uh, how well do they pull versus how well do they squat? Um, how well do they jump? Do they jump with a hinge? Do they jump with a with a proper counter movement squat? Uh, and and then analyzing what what the areas are that are going to lead to those better improvements. Very nice, very nice. Um, I want to get into more exercises around the hamstring that are I would say more athletic development based. Yeah. Um, not saying the accessories aren't right. But I want to talk about technical coordination movements and reflexive strength movements yeah. and how they tie into hamstring development and not just from maybe a strength standpoint, but also from like making you more athletic standpoint. Yeah, I think the best the best example would be a reflexive movement where I do a drop a dumbbell drop catch and then I would plant my lead leg. So if I catch and I do a dumbbell snatch my lead leg would then cycle onto a box. And what happens then is the, so if I would, I would have my right leg down, I drop with my left hand, I catch with my right, and I rotate quickly into a dumbbell snatch and move forward. So now I'm training my hamstrings how to lengthen and absorb it quickly and then lead to a forward hip extension like I would be driving out of the blocks. I think that that's, and because of the fast, you're like, you like you you lengthen the hamstring really yeah, rapidly and, and you then can, go forward. You can, as an athlete, as the one doing the exercise, you don't all you don't need to use a heavier dumbbell. No, it's like you just need to let it drop longer. Yeah, yeah. And go ke try to catch it faster at a lower catch, spot. Speed forward. And it you can uptick the difficulty, if you will, or yeah, the intensity of that. it, and how far that drop puts you into a, an RDL. Right. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I think that. That's like my go-to using a plate, using a you know dumbbell, anything like that. I think also when when we're looking at it, it's like for, from a from a perspective of technical coordination. One of my favorites is like a high butt snatch. Oh my goodness! You know, or like a low hang snatch, or a low hang high butt, or a pause below the knee. That's where you're gonna see. So a lot of people who are more quad All my jams. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people who are more quad dominant struggle to recruit there. So if if they struggle to really load their hamstrings because they're such good squatters, uh, they might tend to have a little bit more lower back pain. So that's where it's like having them learn how to recruit their hamstrings with their lower back improves that position. So doing a slow eccentric low hang or pause below the knee or or a high butt snatch, that's where you're going to see the best um, payoff. Little self-promotion here. I do have a video. It is a press out of me pausing below the knee, snatching 125 kilos. Yeah, I feel like you paused it for like seven seconds. It wasn't that, not that one wasn't that long. I did 117 for, for like, like a seven second pause. Yeah. And I remember um, you gave DJ crap because he was work like he wasn't going as heavy as me. Yeah. Like on a different day when he was yeah, training. Yeah, yeah. And like 
DJ's way yeah. stronger. Than, like there was yeah. no reason. Like he should have been hitting one thirties. Yeah, yeah. And you like used me as like a shaming tool on him, <laughs> but not like to make him feel bad. Like DJ, come, like yeah. What are you doing? And then the next week, DJ went and did, did what he's supposed to. Yeah, because yeah. DJ's so freaking strong. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, the that's, pause stuff. Uh, that's my shaming's my my forte. It wasn't really shaming. It was just more like, here's your potential. Yeah. What are you doing right Fulfill now? Fulfill that, please. Yeah. Especially because at the time, DJ was like competing to win like golds at nationals yeah, and yeah. Like, try to represent USA. So, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the shaming part. Yeah. <laughs> um, hamstrings, reflexive movements. You like the high butt stuff with the technical coordination. Let's talk about this high butt snatch because it's a very counterintuitive movement mm -hmm. because. Anyone who would see it done, especially in a weightlifting background, would be like, like oh, my God. Yeah. No. Like, that's not how you're supposed to do it. Don't yeah. do this. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. There's so many things wrong with it. But let's talk through, though, why to do it. Like, So if I have someone who, let's say in the weightlifting realm, they struggle with getting their knees back. Now, with a high butt, and let's say your butt basically starts in line with your head, now your knees are already cleared. Like you, you're already back with your knees. So to start the lift, you have to raise your chest, which leads to your hamstrings. It's all your hamstrings that are going to do the work right off the floor. So if I have somebody with weak hamstrings, this is a movement that they can use. I like to use it in sports, uh, sports performance. If I've got like wrestlers, they're in positions like that all the time. Swimmers even, they come out of the blocks with their butt really high. So now they learn a movement that that has that high butt position that can transfer really well for wrestlers. You know, if they're in that position, someone's heavy on their head there, they have a lot of hip flexion. So that's where it's like, it, it, it's, it's a good exercise for athletes and it's a good exercise specific to weightlifting depending upon the issues. Yeah. And weightlifting it's variation day. It's being used. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm a, I'm going to take a gander. It's used like probably more exposure comprehension yeah. because it does mess with tech with the pattern. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then, like you said, with the sports performance side, like technique matters, but it's not like be all end all, if you will. Like right. we understand they're training for this sport. This is a tool to get them better in that sport. Yes, we want their technique to improve, but if it means, hey, this variation is going to have more transfer of training, like then we can change that. Yeah, yeah. We, we can use that a little bit with there. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you have any other reflexive movements? I know that the drop dumbbell snatch or like one you'd want to use and like i like the plate too where we would rotate as well because the rotation can change what the knee is doing um and the hip has to be a little bit more aware and the trunk has to be more aware uh and if you take that through to a hip lock like you rotate here and then you come up to a hip lock that lengthens like crazy and then you come all the way through hip extension so you're looking at a very very long range of motion um but i think typically that's what where we're gonna be okay yeah you ready for uh, overrated, underrated? Oh, yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Are there people? There's yeah. people watching. I'm so excited. Look at that. Wow. Do we have questions? Are we holding off? We do. Let's do overrated, underrated first. And then we'll go. We'll... Let's see if we can trigger anybody. All right. Waffles or pancakes? <laughs> <laughs> Waffles. <Yeah. laughs> Stiff leg deadlifts. Overrated underrated underrated by far oh why 100 percent underrated stiff like a deadlift nobody yeah, does them underrated you think they're overrated i don't know i, don't, just I think you. stiff like a deadlifts are over what did i say i think you said underrated yeah they're underrated yeah because so you have to come forward so much and people will try to do them and they're doing an rdl and it's like RDL has more knee flexion. Yeah. A stiff legged, you're almost entirely locked out. And I want to see the hamstrings get really, Is that really... a mobility issue with people? It, and now, it, that could be true. But if you've got the mobility, I love them. I absolutely love them. All right. Back extensions on the glute ham developer. Overrated, underrated. I don't know how much other people do them. I, I don't know... Oh my goodness! I would say underrated again because I think you should be doing them. You almost. love every exercise. <laughs> yeah, I think you should almost be doing them every <laughs> single day. Like, dude, we have in the morning sessions like with our athletes that train twice a day. 
they'll do they'll do glute ham or back extension literally before they even start their their training session they'll do their warm-up they'll do their their mobility they'll do all of that and then they do back extensions in the morning to to like get everything rolling even further yeah. so i i don't know i would do them almost all the time and they're so good for your posture too i just sat up thinking about them i remember one time you told me you put it in the program use this weight and the worst thing was trying to find someone to help me put, put the on weight your, on my yeah. back Haley always complains about that. She's like, you want me to use like 60 kilos on my back? Yeah. And who am I going to get to put the bar on my back? Yeah. Like, all right, just use like 45 or but 50. But you, how do I say it? When you have that, the weight you would prescribe like on your back and you're doing it, you feel strong and everyone looking at you is like, whoa. What are you doing? Yeah. Man? Yeah. Even if it's only like two people. Yeah. Jason, were you signaling us there was something that came up? Jason's yep. got the mic. He's yeah. got the mic. Uh, uh, he's on got, live. He got a mic now. <laughs> he's I, on I, live. I got a mic. Um, so for over under for overrated underrated, pineapple on pizza. Oh, you know what's funny? We just had this discussion, <laughs> and I'm a pineapple on pizza person. I'm totally overrated on this one, but I'm also very very aware that I feel it's overrated. Huh. Like I like pineapple on pizza. I like it with bacon. But you talk to people who are like the diehard pineapple pizza people, and they're like, this is the greatest thing ever. I don't like, like pineapple. So. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think it's overrated. Dude, I just love pepperoni on pizza. No. Love pepperoni. I'm more civilized than that. And don't eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we do? We do. We do. do. How about Earl does... How many more? I got one more overrated, underrated, and then an either or. Okay, so two more, and then we'll go audience. All right. Um, like the military march, like that stiff-legged march. Do you ever see people do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, With like the one, and they like bend down and do yeah, it. Yeah, like overrated, death underrated. Death march. Death march, I think, is underrated because I don't think anybody really does it. Everything's. A- Who's doing the death march other than us? I don't know. I, I remember like back in the day seeing videos of like Penley's guys doing it, but nobody really does it. I will it. tell you an incredibly hard movement that I discovered in a yoga practice. Ooh, okay. Do you want me to do it now or do you want me to wait? You can wait. All right, I'll wait. And yeah. then everyone else could be like, what did he say? Yeah, whoever cares. All right, <laughs> either or. Tyler, the creator, or Earl Sweatshirt. Tyler, the creator, only because I feel like Earl Sweatshirt, like the the last like five years hasn't like popped off really. That's all. That's all because he, he didn't get more famous. I, I just feel like he could he, he could be developing the breadth of his work more. And I feel like Tyler, the creator, I've never seen him live, but I know a lot of people who have seen him and they're like, dude, it's his shows are amazing. Uh, I feel like he's done more collabs and he's like built himself out a bit more. I will say, what is it? Is it Earl Sweatshirt's one uh, song w- with RZA? It's like the most vulgar. Um, he he's I don't know if I can't say this on air, but um, I know my favorite Earl Sweatshirt it's my, line. My my, and it's very old. This like, one this one is um, about freckles off of somebody's face. Oh, <laughs> and, and it's RZA saying it. And then everything goes back to Earl Sweatshirt. But I would say, I think generally, they're both great, but I think generally speaking, I would air on the side. Tyler, the creator. Yeah. yeah. I'm Earl Sweatshirt all day. I could see that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All right, audience. How many audience ones are we going to go with? Be their spokesperson, Jason. I only chose ones I really liked uh, (laughs) and related to the conversation. So from Obi-Wan Quixote. Uh, Dane, I think you remember him before. Yeah, yeah, Obi Wan Quixote. What's up, bro? I thought it was gonna be Quixote. So, beginner athlete seems to get hamstring, knee, and ankle pain when doing uh, leg workouts, but can't but I can't see any significant significant imbalances or form issues. Any accessories to help build resilience? Um, ankle, knee, and hamstring issues. I would say make sure that they're capable of achieving a large degree of dorsiflexion in their ankle. I would do, you know, what I I like. This might sound more advanced, but I like doing like a, let's say a split squat on a pyre on like a, not Pyrex, geez, split squat on like a PVC or split squat on one of our, you know, one of our single leg knee pads that we sell. 
um, to force them to be a little bit more stable in their ankle when they're doing a split squat. I think that can help. Um, I would also try to even, I think sometimes when people are squatting um, or doing movements, if you just put on like a distraction or if you're doing like a, if you put a band around their knees, sometimes that can alleviate any knee stress or it can also uh, help with other, other areas. Um, that's interesting though, that they would have ankle knee and hamstring issues. So I think um, sled pulls forward also would help where the, where the weight is behind them and they have to walk forward. It's like a, like a March that can help as well. Like a, a draft horse basically. Clydesdale. Yeah, Clydesdale. Okay, so we'll do two more. Two more. And we'll run through them pretty quick. Okay. Um, so this is from Jabari. Uh, he has a question of, how did you grow your YouTube channel? I'm 13 years old and starting a fitness channel, and we're looking for some tips. Good job, Jabari. Way to go out and, and hit that. I think the biggest thing that uh, I would say is just consistency. Have like a vision of where you want to be in 10 years and try and work back from that 10-year point and say, all right, if I want to do this in the next 10 years, by the time you're 23, let's say, because you're 13, I want to have a million subs or I want to have, you know, 5 million views a month, something like that. You've got to post consistent, consistently and you've got to just say like every single week, I'm going to post twice a week. And, and as you get better and better and better, you'll figure out what works and what doesn't work. I, and I would recommend watching someone like Mr. Beast, watching his really old videos to see how raw and unrefined he was and you can use that almost as inspiration just to to build into who you are and who you know what persona you put off um throughout your creative work watch any watch any uh garage strength youtube video before from, 2021 yeah yeah <laughs> uh so from you literally have 13 years of content of, of showing what yeah. not to do on youtube correct <laughs> yes um Good so work dane <laughs> phenomenal work glad you were out there just like your raw milk <laughs> yeah we're finally pasteurized now. <laughs> yeah. um so we got one more uh interesting here i think you can relate to well dane um from samuel how do you deal with athletes who are obsessed with perfection Ooh. he's really dedicated but talks himself down a lot when in things go bad in training or in competition i think i think self-doubt in um not just self-doubt, but also self-deprecation is really rooted in, in a bigger issue. And I think that, I mean, especially self-deprecation, I think it's, it's, it's okay. And like, I, I'm self-deprecating pretty regularly, but I think a lot of it is more rooted in like a self-conscious uh, issue I might have or, or the way I perceive myself uh, in a specific social setting. And so, I think when you're thinking about um, being overly perfect, you're constantly looking through this lens of judgment from others. And you see like, I can only do this as well as I possibly can. Otherwise people will see me in some specific light. And then when you don't achieve something in that specific light, then you further your own judgment uh, upon this perception of other people's judgment. And it's sort of like this negative, you know, downward spiral. And I think in all reality, the biggest thing is like recognizing that no one's judging you. No one is, no one is taking their time to look at your actions through this negative light. If you're doing an exercise or something, and I, we see it here a lot at, at Garage Strength where someone will come in and be like, oh my gosh, I can't do a snatch. I, I, or I can't do squats this way. Like, like they'll compare themselves to somebody else. And it's like, dude we're not asking you to, to move like Haley or to move like a, a you know luck. world yeah world-class <laughs> weightlifter or a world-class athlete we're just asking you to move and i think that taking it step by step and recognizing that is a is a is a part of the process to healing that that conscious or self-conscious that deep-rooted issue that you might be having and it's just going to take years and years to get to get through that that process and just recognize that it's okay to not be perfect it's okay to to um to execute something with flaws and what that just means is now you can have more more time to learn and more time to 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 lead to improvement earl we got all the audience stuff is that they all the audience they don't want to hear what i have to say you did a great job <laughs> thanks earl so i would say 
head over to peakstrength.app, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store, and you guys can download our Peak Strength app. There are podcast sponsor if you guys want more garage strength podcast something like this head over to our garage strength podcast channel and we're going to try to do these podcasts live i want to say once a week or once every two weeks yeah so this is a pretty sweet experiment i'm glad that we did this we're yeah, also, first time ever yeah first time ever this we're also live on uh my ghost face d milla uh instagram so I, and podcast apps. yeah and don't Wait, you're just d milla now Ghostface D Miller. Oh, okay. I was yeah. like, what happened to the Ghostface yeah. part of there? Yeah, Ghostface D Miller. And make sure you listen oh. to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and whatever other podcast apps that you're using. And as always, please leave us five stars and we let us know what you think. You. Yeah. Comment down below with what you want us to talk about next. Until next time, peace. Later. Bye bye. <laughs>